Hello, and welcome back to The Offspring Magazine, the podcast. It's Bea, and I will be hosting today's podcast. Today, we will talk to Dr. Ben Ryan, who is a postdoc in Dr. Robert Malenka's lab at Stanford University, and is also a science communicator. He started his science communication journey in 2020 when he made a video on how to wear a mask during COVID time, and this video went viral on TikTok the next morning. Since then, he has continued to post about neuroscience and lately also started making videos on common misconceptions in science with the aim to debunk any misinformation about science put online. Currently, he has over 850,000 followers on TikTok and 80,000 on Instagram. I've been following him for over a year now, and I can highly recommend following him if you are interested in cool neuroscience topics. His videos are short, concise, and full of cool information that you don't want to be missing out on. I'm so happy that Ben accepted our invitation to have a conversation and talk to me today. Since science communication is becoming more and more important and is also becoming a very popular career choice among scientists, I decided to talk to him about his journey in science communication. Ben shares his top tips on how to make it in science communication, the good, but also the difficult sides of science communication, and how he balances his time between a postdoc and still doing science communication. So part one, which is obviously released today, will be on science communication. In part two, which will be released next week, we will have a more science-based conversation, particularly on autism, which was the subject of Ben's PhD, and also about the neuroscience behind empathy and pain. And that's currently what he's doing his postdoc on. And we're also going to be talking about some funky neuroscience uh, effects and the placebo effect. So stay tuned for that. But today... Please enjoy this conversation on science communication with Dr. Ben Ryan. Hello, Ben. Um, Just start as per usual, introduce yourself, tell us what you do, and also the reason, I guess, why I asked you to come on. Certainly, yeah. So my name is Ben Ryan. I'm a postdoc at Stanford University um, in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, but my research is in neuroscience, and I'm studying the neuroscience of empathy right now. Uh, Outside of the lab, I also do science communication work where I share uh, educational videos on social media apps like TikTok and Instagram. And the reason you invited me is to share a bit about the science communication work and discuss my research. And hopefully we'll get to both and have exciting things to discuss about, about both of those things. Yeah, exactly. I'm definitely excited to learn about how you started in science communication because that's definitely not easy, especially now where you're not, I guess with TikTok, it's different, but if you, if you want to start on like YouTube or something, or even podcasting, you're kind of, it's, it's too late. Um, (laughs) Everyone's doing it right now, you know, but I guess, so that's why I think it's even harder to get started in science communication. So how exactly did you start and build a platform? Yeah. And I will say before I get into that, um, I do think if you are a non-scientist and you want to start a podcast about horseback riding or something like that it might be too late there's there's tons of content on the internet but if you're a scientist and you want to get started i don't think it's too late because i think there are far fewer scientists on the internet than there need to be um but yeah those platforms are definitely very mature and developed and there are seems like billions of people on there trying to be yeah i guess like the competition is just a lot higher like if you started podcasting 10 years ago you probably would have a very big platform right now it would have been a lot easier to kind of become very successful at it where you can Mm -hmm. do it as like a full-time job. I think if you start now, it's just, there's a lot more competition. So you really have to be exceptionally good to make it. Yeah, for sure. It's almost like when these, when these apps start, you know, like YouTube or TikTok, they're very, it's like, it's, well, we're going to get in here, but it's, it's a bit like the development of the brain. There's a ton of plasticity (laughs) and, you know, the apps that like, they want so much change to be happening and they want people to start like, you know, the, it's much easier to like grow a platform when they start because they want people to grow a platform and they want people to start yeah. using these these apps. And now they have so many people on them that they, you know, there's no incentive anymore for the algorithm to make a random person go viral. Um, it still does, but 
it seems like that happens a lot more in the beginning. So I guess yeah. another thing I'll just throw out there, if you see like, for example, Facebook just started a new platform called Super. It's a live streaming app. Maybe you should go on there if you want to get started. You know, I think starting in the new places um, is a good way to start. You won't, you know, you won't be recognized from being on another platform. Like people might not recognize you from YouTube. Like they might recognize someone like Hank Green, but maybe that's a good thing because there'll be a lot of new faces on the platform. So yeah. anyways, sh I should answer the question you asked me a few minutes ago, um, which was, if I remember correctly, how I got started, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's actually a funny story because um, in 2020, I was just a regular old PhD student, no interest in science communication, only interested in finishing up my thesis. And, um, and the pandemic started. And so I went to Walmart uh, to get some groceries or something. And I just noticed like everyone was wearing their masks wrong. I don't have a mask with me to demonstrate, but I don't either, actually. Yeah, I'm at home. So, you know, the people I, I knew from working in the lab that you clasp the metal bar to your nose and you expand it. And, you know, and I'll admit for a while in the lab, I, I didn't realize all that stuff. I thought you just put it flat to your face. And then you realize, oh, wait a minute, there are these other features. And this is how the mask is supposed to be worn. And so the general public was in that early stage of, I just put this thing on my face. I don't know, you know, I don't expand it. I don't clasp it. And so I went to the, the when I went to Walmart, I noticed that everyone was wearing them wrong. And I thought, oh, maybe, maybe some of my friends and family would benefit from like a short instructional video on how to wear one of these, just since I happened to know how to do this. And um, it's sort of in, it's sort of the same reason why I got into academia is because I love to mentor and share information and if I have a piece of knowledge that someone else could benefit from, it is a joy for me to share it with them. So it was in that spirit that I created this video. And I was looking for an app where I could film myself. Um, and I happened to have TikTok on my phone. I had recently downloaded it. So I filmed myself on TikTok. And I actually wanted the video so I could post it on my Facebook and Instagram. But the only way to download it was to post it. You had to upload it. Mm. And so I uploaded it on, Insta on TikTok. With, you know, my username was like user 7741, like just a string of numbers. I had no profile picture and the video just went viral. Uh, it got like 1.8 million views. Um, and it, actually, I, I hope to think that it may have instructed a lot of people on how to wear masks at a time. It, this was April 2020, right when COVID was starting and people were first sort of grappling with this change. Yeah. Um, and I And I really felt that impact of like, I have no idea if it helped anyone, but the fact that almost 2 million people saw this and at a time when they really needed to see it and no one else was creating this type of video, um, it made me realize like, holy cow, social media can be really, really effective for science communication. And so I debated, you know, do I want to do this? Do I want to make videos on the internet? I definitely don't want to talk about COVID and I'm glad I didn't because it becomes really, really... Oh gosh, uh, that's so controversial as well. <laughs> no. Yeah, you get into a lot of uh, harassment, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but so I just started answering questions about the brain and slowly, but surely I figured out, you know, what works, what doesn't, how to, how to actually edit a video and stuff. And, uh, it just sort of went from there naturally. Wow. Um, that's kind of like the dream. I wish <laughs> I would post a video and it would just go viral. I once tried to post a YouTube video. I, I mean, we were like me and my boyfriend were making this like YouTube video. Uh, we entered into the competition and it was like a one minute YouTube video you had to make about a science topic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I posted it like next day, zero views. So it's definitely <laughs> not the success story that you had. But that's awesome that um, I think it's also TikTok. With TikTok, yeah. like you can really get a lot of views and you were probably one of the first ones using TikTok or like posting videos on TikTok? Because I think TikTok like started becoming big during like COVID time. So that's yeah. probably also like what helped you um, with your platform. Definitely. And that's why I say what I said about, you know, getting in early. Um, I mean, there were a lot of creators on the app already, but it was in the early stages. And it was, I don't know, I have this sort of like uh, nostalgic memory of, 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 um, TikTok at that time, it was like these certain sounds that would just circulate. And, you know, now you hear them and you're like, oh, those are old. Like, it, it's funny. And they, but there were very few scientists on the platform at the time. That's what and, I was thinking as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that was a big distinction. And now there are tons. I mean, there's there's never enough, in my opinion, like I said, but there are way more now. And it's so exciting to see um, because, you know, scientists and 
doctors and nurses that have all started to figure out how these apps work and how to use them to communicate information to the public. And, uh, and they've grown popular. And, and I love to see that. It's nice to see, you know, alongside the dances and the, you know, all the different forms of talent that we have on TikTok, people exhibiting their talents. We also have experts exhibiting their knowledge. And I think that's really important for society. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's especially important because of like the algorithms that are kind of used for social media, you can kind of really go into like loopholes. Um, and this especially happens, I think, with like misinformation, I think it's like easier to spread misinformation, because mm. of the way the algorithms are designed. And I think by just having more scientists on the platform, you can kind of get out probably more, like, good content. Right. That, that will help to debunk the kind of, you know, misinformation that's on there. Exactly. Yeah. I think it's both about balancing it with evidence-based information and also having enough people, having enough eyes on the platform so that, for example, my research is on autism or social behavior or empathy. So that if I see something completely wrong about autism, I can be there to detect it and then make a video explaining why I think that's wrong or why in my experience that's wrong. Yeah. Um, there's just not enough people out there because it normally... The actually the opposite tends to happen where someone will create a video with misinformation and some big celebrity or someone will like make a duet to that video where the you know, the original video is playing on one side and their reactions playing on the other side. And they're just like mind blown, like, whoa, this is crazy. And then it gets even more exposure. So the, the opposite effect is happening where people are becoming convinced and then propagating it even further. So it's it's troublesome. Yeah. The thing is, it's one thing to have one video go viral, but it's another thing to actually build a platform and kind of make it. And I would say you've kind of made it on social media as a science communicator based on the number of followers that you have. So thank you. What what did you do to actually build your platform? Um, was it more like the type of video that helped or like the topics that you chose? Yeah, um, I am a scientist. And so I definitely took a sort of experimental approach. Um, I, like I looked that. at, yeah, I looked at a lot of the metrics, um, tried to, I, I'm actually funny enough. I am not sure if this episode will air before then, but, um, in November I'm giving a poster presentation at the society for neuroscience meeting, which is like the biggest neuroscience meeting in the world. And I'm presenting a poster on my TikTok data. I analyzed 140 videos. I pulled all the metrics and I ran a bunch of analyses and, uh, trying to figure out like what makes the algorithm work, you know, what makes videos go viral. And which I'm pretty sure is against TikTok rules. And I probably will get kicked off the platform if they ever find out that I did that. Um, and so I won't make a TikTok video about that. Uh, and also looking at like what makes people engage with the content. And, you know, at this point, it's it's too late. This would, I, I was kind of figuring this out anecdotally, not quantifiably throughout the time I was creating videos, especially in the early days. Um, and by the way, for anyone wondering, what makes videos go viral is basically just engagement. It's really just, do people like the video? Do people comment? Or actually, sorry, not comment. Comment has an inverse relationship. So as you oh, might wow. expect, yeah, the more views, we're just looking at a simple linear regression. The more views a video has, the fewer comments or the lower the ratio of people who view the video to those who comment is. So fewer people comment, which makes sense. So commenting probably doesn't contribute to the algorithm, maybe in the beginning. Um, but likes and shares are like the top two predictors. So if your video has like more than 20% of viewers like it, it's, it's set to go viral, especially if the, in the first like thousand views anyways. Um, so I know that now I didn't know that all throughout the beginning. So I just kind of experimented with different styles of videos. And I spent a long time trying to figure out like, what the heck am I doing here? Cause I, I started with this video of how to wear a mask. And what tends to happen to people on TikTok is they post a video, it goes viral. And their entire platform becomes about that one video. You know, like they post a video about them cleaning their toilet with some amazing, you know, thing you'd never expect. And then their entire platform is, look at all these other, let me try all these other things to clean my toilet. Like they always go way overboard on that one thing. And I didn't want to do that at all because I did not want to talk about masks because it wasn't my expertise. Um, and I also, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but I didn't want to get harassed and I would have gotten harassed. Um, but so, also it, it sounds kind of boring to talk about masks all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and I will, I will admit, I did make one or two other videos about masks where I, you know, I did a little literature review and I was like, look, there's evidence that masks actually work um, in hospital settings. But anyways, I, yeah, I just started trying different things. I, I tried um, 
recent papers, you know, like a lit, like a journal, journal club kind of thing, like a little quick review, um, or older papers that are more like standard textbook knowledge, um, or taking all the papers out of it and just textbook knowledge. Like this is how the optic, the visual system works, you know? Um, and I just kind of learned what people like and what people don't like and based on what went viral and what didn't. And I found that, uh, people like to feel up to date, I think. So I think when new papers come out, those are the things that tend to do the best. And I also realized, (laughs) which is funny because in the beginning, I, I really did not want to, um, be on the internet actually at all. I, I was really embarrassed and I was really nervous that my colleagues would see this and be like, what the heck are you doing on TikTok? Like, that's embarrassing, buddy. I was, I was really worried about this fate. And it turns out that the opposite is true. People are like, yeah, yeah, you know, it's TikTok, but it is really important. And you are doing like a good job of summarizing these papers in a way that's accurate. Thank goodness people say that to me because I'm very insecure (laughs) about making a mistake. Um, But what I was really worried about was like going overboard into like the super exaggerated, overexpressive, sensationalizing type of content. And so if you go back to my very first videos, I'm extremely monotone and I look really nervous and it's, it's really funny. I'm just kind of like, let me tell you something about the brain that I learned recently. And it's so, it's really uncomfortable to watch for myself. What I learned over time is that people like to see someone get excited about a topic. And so I slowly allowed my personality to come through a bit more. And sometimes I even purposely exaggerate things and, you know, go overboard with excitement because it gets the viewer excited. And when they see someone being so pumped up about some weird pharmacology neuroscience study that they would never have any interest in, suddenly they're kind of interested in it because they want to know why this person is so excited about it. And that is one of the main things I've learned is that you just have to be excited. And some people go crazy with this. <laughs> I've seen, I know, I'm not going to name any names, but I know some certain creators who like, they make really wild facial expressions and like they, like their voice is all over the place. And um, I find it a little bit t- too much tough to swallow. Like, yeah, but, um, but it works. It works. And these are all successful creators. So, you know, I, I think it can be cheesy and it can be gimmicky. Um, and I wouldn't encourage anyone to go overboard with it, but I do think it's an important thing to know. Yeah, I think personality is actually extremely important. I think that's probably yeah. something that people don't realize. Like, even if you have probably like good topic and uh, interesting topic, interesting content, good editing skills, like if your personality is not what the viewers want, you probably won't make it. Um, and that's obviously really hard to also just like improve on. But clearly, just by posting a lot of videos, you also learn how to like mm-hmm. improve that your image on social media. Yeah. And um, I'm also going to add another, another cautionary note uh, here. If, if you are posting on social media and you're not doing well, it's not because people hate your personality. Um, <laughs> there are many other factors involved, but um, yeah, the topics is also a very interesting thing. Um, just I'm a chemist and I realized like I could not do videos on my topic it's just so Mm -hmm. like no one's really interested in organic chemistry like no one you know it's just it's it's hard to like get this excitement from people Mm -hmm. whereas i think with like neurobiology and like all the videos you post i think the general public can really get excited but i just wonder within your field obviously it's so big how do you choose exactly what topic to post on yeah, this is, I've, I've sort of developed an intuitive sense for it over time. Um, in the beginning, there was a point maybe like three or four months in where I had a list of topics and I got through all of them and I said, that's it. I'm done. There's nothing more I can cover. And then I started, I don't know, it, it was around that time that I must have developed this sort of awareness of like a new paper comes out and it just feels like this is something that people will be interested in. Um, and now I have a document that's like 40 pages long of it's literally just like bullet points of papers that I want to make videos on and I will never get to all of them and it grows faster than it shrinks. But um, yeah, I mean, people are interested in what affects them. Everyone's selfishly motivated in some way, um, you know, which is perfectly fine. We're all alive and controlling our own bodies and lives. So we want to know things that will affect our bodies and lives. So people are interested in like, 
in neuroscience, everyone has a brain, everyone has emotions, everyone has thoughts. Uh, and so people are interested in things like sleep. You know, we all sleep. People are interested in things like memory. We all memorize things, but not everyone's interested in something like Huntington's disease, you know, because not everyone has it. Not everyone knows someone who has it. Um, and of course, you know, those topics are still important to cover. And when there are breakthroughs, I like to talk about them, but those videos never go viral and I don't expect them to because people aren't interested in that stuff. So, you know, like rare genetic disease, not a good topic for virality. Um, but, you know, a new paper that shows that like coffee makes your brain degenerate, which is not a real thing. Um, everyone's going to care about that because everyone drinks coffee and everyone wants their brain to remain healthy. So, yeah. 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 Um, what about your misconception videos? Because uh, you've recently posted a lot more about like misconceptions, which you didn't used to do in the past. At least when I started following you, you didn't have any of those videos. What made you get into that? Well, thank you for following me. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think of the. You know, I, I will say I'm not sure if you know Dr. Inna Konevsky. She's a psychologist. But she's amazing. Um, I love her. She's like, I feel like I don't know her well enough to say like she's like my mom, but I feel like like she's like my mother in Psycom. Um, she inspired me because she actually was doing these debunking videos because there's so much, especially in the, in the realm of psychology, there's so much misinformation where people are like, psychology says that this or that. It's, it's all over the place. And she just, you know, would come with these sassy, snappy, like, <laughs> like psycho really psychology says it doesn't i'm a psychologist and it's this is fake and and it was doing so well and i was like wow i really love the way she's doing this um and i was inspired by it and i didn't see anyone doing that in neuroscience and so i as whenever i saw neuroscience videos i just started debunking them and um and i found that that also got a really really good response you know just like people were interested in things that apply to them and new breakthrough studies people were really interested in watching someone correct a misinterpretation or misrepresentation of a study. And I think people are equally interested in watching someone do that with anger and like violence towards the person um, because TikTok is fueled in part by animosity and controversy and division, unfortunately. Um, but I don't do that when I do my mis misinformation debunking videos, at least nowadays. I do them as like calmly and professionally as I can. And I always give the person who was spreading the misinformation the benefit of the doubt. You know, there's, there's misinformation, which is accidental spreading of false information. There's disinformation, which is intentionally misleading someone. I always assume that it's misinformation and that the person didn't do it on purpose. And uh, I think that people also identify with that and appreciate that in a way where it's like, you know, this, I, I really could have been a lot more, mean and harsh and I wasn't and I think approaching it with compassion appeals to a lot of people yeah yeah definitely yeah de but um some of your misconception not all your misconception videos are on neuroscience right yeah true or would you but like or would you say like most you still try to mm, do most of them on like your expertise yeah, I mean, my biggest fear is being wrong on the internet. Yeah, and that I would feel the exact same way. Yeah, <laughs> like, I would have, I would be stressed that I don't know everything. I definitely don't know everything, not nearly. Um, all the information I share is directly from the literature. I pull from the literature, make a video, and then immediately forget it, so I can't even talk about it again. Um, yeah. not on purpose. I wish I could remember it, but uh, these just aren't topics that I've, you know, spent a career learning about. Um, so. Yeah, I, 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 the decision to make a debunking video is when I feel that I already have enough evidence um, or an understanding of a topic to debunk it, or I do a quick literature review and I immediately find something where it would be a clear contrast to what they're saying. Um, so like you mentioned, there have been debunks where, which are outside of neuroscience. Like for example, someone made a video saying my baby's vegan and they don't, know, they don't exactly. need sunscreen. I was thinking about that one. Yeah, yeah. And so... Um, that one, it's such a dangerous video to put out. They had the, and for anyone who hasn't seen it, there's this baby. I mean, I'm really bad at identifying the age of babies. This baby was probably like six months old, maybe. Year, yeah. Probably six months old. It was like, it was. 
a toddler. It was a toddler and it was on a rock and it was just in the blazing sun. And the lady was videotaping it and, and she wrote, does your baby need sunscreen because they're vegan? And then she just wrote no, like a big no on screen. And then the video ends. And it's just like, my goodness, <laughs> what a horrible thing to put on the internet. First off, it doesn't matter. Every single baby should avoid sun because their skin is so thin. This is one of the things I did remember from <laughs> my uh, my debunking videos. But their skin is so thin that they can have serious um, like skin damage from the sun. And so wearing sunscreen is super important. And being vegan changes nothing about your skin thickness. Um, so yeah, in that case, I was prepared to be wrong if I needed to just to contrast this video because I felt that it was such a health hazard to be on the internet. And it was like, you know, this person, this creator, I think she has like a million followers or more. Wow. Yeah, she just constantly, she's constantly posting stuff like this too where she, like she lets her baby like suck on dirty rocks from streams and stuff. It's it's just like, I you know, not what I would do for my child personally. Um, definitely wouldn't put it on the internet. I, I admire your misconception videos, especially when they're done in, in like different fields or topic areas because i can imagine you really you got to spend so much time doing like the literature search and oh, yeah. it probably takes you a lot longer to make those videos than talking about like a paper that's in your field which is probably a lot easier to talk about right absolutely those videos take a long time because i need to gra like grasp the full like breadth of the literature you know i can't just read one paper it's like if i'm gonna debunk someone on a topic that I'm not familiar with, I need to read at least five or six papers and make sure that like they're all consistent with each other. And then I get an understanding of like where the field kind of stands and that people like multiple labs have found the same finding and that everyone's kind of on the same page about this thing. Because otherwise, I don't want to just say, well, here's one paper that goes against that and put it on the internet. And then turns out that was the one bad paper. And there were 10 other papers that showed the opposite was true, you know, because that happens. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also knowing like what papers are the good ones to read. Yeah. Um, Because there's there's a lot of papers on the internet. It's just the problem is which ones are the best ones mm -hmm. from, I guess, the best journals and most reliable sources. Um, so you, all your videos are like short videos. They're like one, two, three minutes. You've, mm -hmm. I don't think you've ever made anything longer. Yeah, um, I don't think so. Do you sometimes want to like make a longer video where you can go into more detail and explain things? bit more like you know you just have a bit more time and stuff always yeah i mean i think good science communication requires a longer video length you know i i think one of the from talking to other people who want to get involved in in tiktok it seems like the biggest challenge for everyone is like and the thing people always ask me is how the heck do you get your videos down to such a short length and keep it accurate and i guess that's just something that i've figured out i don't know like this is the key piece that needs to be in there. This 10 second sentence, it would take me 10 seconds to record me saying it might not be critical. Like I think I can maybe shorten that to just two seconds and one quick note. Um, but you know, you're sacrificing accuracy with every, every time you abbreviate a statement. And so um, I just do my best to, to keep it as accurate as I can in the, in the short time frame. Because unfortunately, if I if I do post three minute videos and I go into greater detail about all those things, the videos just won't do well. I mean, I it's and it's so sad um, and I hate it. But I think personally, it's more important to get a broader range, a larger group of people interested and excited about science, even at like a more superficial level, than to reach those who are already really really interested, interested enough to watch a three minute video of me going into detail. Um, get get those people and give them more information because I can always add, you know, reply to comments and stuff, answer questions. My goal on social media is to excite the general public about science because I think right now in society, um, especially post COVID or through COVID, people have lost a lot of trust in science. Not everyone, but I think at the margins, a lot of people have been driven into sort of extremism, anti-science. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I totally agree with like one minute videos are very useful to kind of scratch the surface and get this interest started in people. And I think in non-scientists, that's extremely important because scientists can listen to a 10 minute video, but non-scientists, I think their, their brain's just going to shut down. So I do, I do agree that like one minute can be very good just for that interest. And then people can go deeper in it if they want. 
Absolutely. Um, and when there's the option for a non-scientist to swipe in just one swift, tiny finger, finger motion to remove themselves from this horrible 10 minute video of a scientist talking and get into a video of a puppy doing a triple backflip, you know, something way more exciting and interesting. They will always do that. And so, um, yeah, it's unfortunately, it's just the platform. If, you know, if I'm in a, at a presentation speaking to a non-scientist group, you know, heck I'll talk for two hours. I don't care. <laughs> they're, they're stuck in that room. Um, but on TikTok, they have the option to leave at any, at any given swipe. How long does it take you to uh, make a video and how do you balance that? You said you were a postdoc, right? Yeah. How do you balance that with like PhD postdoc life? Because um, you started when you were a PhD student, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah I, I started in, in the late stages of my PhD when my like main thesis work was already like in the pipeline to be published. So it was good timing and I had a lot of extra time. Um, the same cannot be said for right now. I'm an early stage postdoc and... Uh, it's a lot, you know, it being a postdoc is like, I don't want to, I don't mean to mislead anyone or just steer people out of science, but being a postdoc is one of the worst fates of <laughs> that could happen to a human. It's, it's so much work, but it's, you know, the, the reason I do it is because I, I want to be an academic professor. Um, and I'm extremely lucky that I work in a lab where I get to manage my own workload. And, uh, and that's pretty much how I make it work. That's how, how I am able to do this because you know, I set up my experiments, I schedule them. That's my top priority. I make sure that any given week or any given day, I'm getting done all the experiments that I possibly can. And I'm just going into the lab, crushing these experiments as fast as I can, you know, of course, being rigorous and careful. Um, and then I come home and uh, do extracurricular science communication stuff. That sounds very stressful. So how, how long do you spend per day uh, with the science communication? Um, it's, it's super fluctuates. I mean, it, yeah. You or know, per week, like an average general. Um, that's a good question. Let's say, so I, in keeping into this number, I'm factoring in filming videos, you know, reading papers, research, yeah, making the scripts also, um, things like this, doing podcasts, you know, replying to emails, doing meetings with people. I, I get the one thing about science communication that's amazing is I meet a lot of people. You know, there are not so many scientists on the internet. So whenever a company or whatever is looking for a scientist, I'm one of the few people that they know and they reach out to me and I get to meet all these cool people. So I, it, a lot of meetings and things like that take time. I would probably say I spend, I don't know, 20, 25 hours a week on it. Wow. Yeah, I work that's, weekends. Uh, that's long. Well, yeah, I mean, you have to, right? You only have 24 hours a day. Yeah. So, yeah, and a and postdoc is that. definitely not a nine to five job. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but I'm lucky. I mean, my boss is supportive. Um, he, I don't think he knows the full extent of how much I do in this space. And I hope he doesn't listen to this podcast. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on and, and I, it's, I find it exciting. So, you know, I do my best to balance both. But I, of course, at the end of the day, my, primary research project is the thing that's going to get me a faculty position if I do the, end up going that route. Um, so that is what, you know, gets the, gets my time first. So I guess in the future you want to go into academia, become a professor, but you still plan to do the science communication yeah. as long as you enjoy it. Yep. That's the goal. I think, you know, it constantly changes and being in, Sil I'm at Stanford. So being in Silicon Valley, I've met people at Google and meta and things like that youtube and amazon and everyone's like oh you should consider coming to work for us and just the thought of immediately tripling my salary is encouraging yeah. um and you know it's an alluring it's temptation but i uh as i mentioned you know i love mentoring i love teaching and i love research and i love science and i've also thought about you know if i leave science and i go work at google let's say and i I'm on the internet talking about neuroscience. Who am I to be talking about neuroscience? I'm not a neuroscientist anymore. So it's not a huge factor, but I have thought about that, that, you know, I should probably remain active in this field if I want to remain a credible source on this topic. Because also, I mean, if I go work at Google, I'm probably going to stop paying attention to the literature and, and then, yeah. you know, my merit to talk about these things actually does decline. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. So, but you, you wouldn't do like just science communication in the future. I thought like start about your own it. podcast or whatever. 
Yeah, I mean, I've definitely thought about it, you know, through the early times of my postdoc where the research was tough, you know, and I'm starting to get a project started, I entertained all options of how I might yeah. end up outside of academia. And, uh, and that was one of them. But same, same reason, you know, I, that's almost even worse if I'm just a freelance guy, you know, and I have to bank on former neuroscientist in my bio and stuff <laughs> like, I don't want to be that guy. Um, and also, it's just too sporadic. You know, there are ways to make money. There are brand deals and partnerships and talks and things like that. But um, I think I would be extremely stressed if I had to rely on those for an income. And yeah. Uh, also, I guess, again, I love science. I love being in it. Yeah, it probably also just, I don't know, maybe it's a bit easier to make videos because you're constantly staying up to date with the literature. Yeah. Since it's what you do, right? Right. You do videos on what you research. Um, what I always find interesting is like, what kind of mistakes did you make when you started that kind of you could recommend other people like not to do so people can kind of learn from your mistakes oh. or things that maybe you would do differently? It doesn't necessarily need to be a mistake. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked this. Um, many comments here. First off, when I first started, the, ver the very first after the mask video, I posted a video and said, I'm a neuroscientist. Actually, if you want to ask me questions about the brain, please do. One of the first questions I answered was, why does the brain have wrinkles? Great question. And um, I didn't make any mistakes here. But what I did was I just thought, why does the brain have wrinkles? I learned about this one time in undergrad. And I made a video and I didn't consult the literature at all. And what I did for the next month or two was exactly that. I would just make videos on things that I already knew and I wouldn't fact check myself. And it was some point, probably around the three month mark where I realized like, wait a minute, am I even saying things that are true or am I just spreading outdated knowledge from my undergrad years ago? You know, like what, what am I even talking about? And that was like, I was like really embarrassed. I, I couldn't believe um, and I don't think I said anything that was wrong or anything like that, but it was embarrassing for me to realize that I could be contributing to this misinformation on the internet just by thinking, assuming that I know something that's true um, when it really wasn't. And so from then on, I immediately began fact-checking myself and sourcing all my information from the literature. So I would always recommend everyone to hold yourself to a high standard, you know, hold yourself to the standard that you would expect any other person on the internet especially someone outside of science talking about science to hold themselves to don't think that just because you have a degree in science that you know better than anyone else because you know the information is always changing you may have been taught something that's no longer true so that's the first thing another great tip that i uh, wish i had exercised earlier is to not engage in arguments on the internet um, oh yeah classic <laughs> yeah the internet is a very rude and kind of disturbing and ugly place. Um, if you go on there and you start talking about science, heck, if you go on the internet and you start talking about anything, you even show your face, you will be criticized and harassed. It's, it's terrible. It's something I want to actually study down the road of why people do this, but there's really no way around it. And I've seen horrible instances of people, you know, sharing videos of themselves, like, and just getting attacked by everyone in the comments, you know, thousands of mean, insulting comments. And in my case, what I experience is basically people doubting my credentials and saying that I'm wrong and, you know, saying that I'm stupid, things like that. Um, and it's so tempting when I've made this video, I've done my research. I'm certain that everything I say, I scripted my video, everything. It's a script that I wrote based on a scientific paper. I'm certain that everything I said is accurate. Someone comes in and tells me I'm wrong and I'm stupid. I have every reason to tell them, no, you're wrong and you're stupid because uh, not that I would, but you know, I, like I know that I'm right. I know that they're wrong. It's, it's very compelling to potentially go in and argue with them. And as soon as you do that, it immediately just becomes a bad idea. You, you perseverate about, you know, you close your phone and you walk away and you think, mm, I wonder if they left another comment. And you go and you check oh, and yeah. you just get sucked into it. And it's not good for your mental health. And it's also really bad because you don't know what these people on the internet are capable of. Um, I've had bad things happen where someone at one point 
insisted that I was spreading this information and emailed my PI when I, in my PhD lab and the no. president. Yep. They emailed the president of my university and a bunch of local news sources and said, your PhD student is spreading misinformation. He should be kicked out of his program immediately. And I was freaking out. It was like the worst thing that ever happened to me. I was so yeah. scared. Um, I guess while I'm here, I'll just tell the rest of the story. It was about, is a video about uh, SDS in shampoo. It's a detergent and it's, you know, it helps you clean your head. But to some people, it's a skin irritant. And the video was me saying, look, I, it was actually me holding a bottle of SDS in the lab and me saying, look, will you actually use this stuff to break down our brain tissue when we homogenize it in the lab? Um, it might cause skin irritation. And someone was like, no, that's wrong. And so that's where it all started. And when my boss, my PI got the email, she called me into her office and she asked me to explain it. And I did. And she said, oh yeah, no, what do you mean? We, we use SDS free shampoo in my, in my household. It gives me skin irritation. And I was like, yes, thank goodness. And she's like, no, you're right. This is just a crazy person on the internet. Don't worry about it. But it was, it was just so scary. And you never know when you get into an argument with someone on the internet, what the heck they're willing to do. And they have the power of anonymity. They can do anything to you. They can call, they can, what's, what is called uh, swatting someone where you send a SWAT team to their house. I've seen people on, on TikTok. They, there's a person, um, her, her handles Rex or cyst, RX, like prescription or cyst. And she's a doctor and she calls out people for doing horrible things, which is maybe a good service, but she gets, she's kind of intense about it and she gets a lot of backlash and she's had people have called in bomb threats under her and her husband's name. People have sent the police to her home. Um, people have like done horrible things where she's like no longer eligible for loans and stuff like that. That's insane. It's terrible. It's, it's really bad. So I, you know, I, while I encourage scientists to get on the internet and talk about this stuff, I also encourage you to be very cautious and to be aware of the risks that come along with it. Yeah. Wow. I mean, yeah, better just to post and then leave and ignore everything that yep. gets commented on. That's right. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, yeah, so what, what about the future of your platform? Like, do you see yourself changing the format of your videos or moving on to different platforms? I guess you're like, you're on Instagram, you're on TikTok. I don't know what other uh, platforms there really are. Are, are you on YouTube? Uh, I am posting my videos onto YouTube. Um, shout out to my assistant, Margot. She's uploading my videos steadily to YouTube. Um, yeah, they have YouTube shorts, which is like TikTok or, yeah. or Instagram reels. And, uh, I spoke to a representative at YouTube and, and she said, might as well just upload all your videos. So that's what I'm doing now there. Um, I do have a Billy Billy channel, which is sort of inactive. Billy Billy is like Chinese YouTube. Uh, the entire website is in Chinese. Yeah, I had a, a group reached out to me and said, hey, do you want to start a Billy Billy channel? We will run it for you and add Chinese captions and everything like that. Yeah. And um, so I do have that channel, but I'm not really... They, I've since stopped working with them, and now I don't know how to manage the channel because everything's in Chinese. Um, <laughs> so if anyone wants to help me with that, please. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't really see things changing too much. I think until TikTok or Instagram falls apart and I need to adapt to changing circumstances, I'll probably stick to what I'm doing because it, it seems to be working and I've, I've gotten into kind of a nice workflow of how to make these videos come together. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's funny on Instagram, I can actually, so I can see which of my friends is following you. And it's like someone that I went to high school with in Austria is oh, wow. following you as well. And she's not a scientist. Like really? she does journalism stuff. Yeah. And she's following you. And I thought that was crazy. So seems like uh, you're worldwide. <laughs> That's extremely cool. Well, thank yeah. you for sharing that. I, uh, yeah. I mean, early on, I, I, I started interacting with a lot of students in the early days when I was, you know, still growing my platform, I would get a lot of DMS from students asking for, you know, career advice, things like that. And I would just take these meetings and talk to students worldwide. And through these meetings, I started to realize that, you know, people in all, you know, outside of my little scope, I've always lived in America, people all over the world don't have the access to the same types of resources and the same types of mentorship. And so I created this group called the Aspiring Scientists Coalition. And we host, well, I, I have to admit, we haven't done anything in a long time. I've been way too busy, um, but I want to start getting it going again. But we, in the past, we've hosted things like networking events between our members and bringing in scientists to talk about their career. And we have members from over 75 countries. 
So, wow. So that just goes to show how global these platforms are. TikTok, Instagram. I mean, people are tuning in from like all over the world. It's amazing. So it's and all all different science topics as well, or is it just a neuro a neuroscience? Uh, all science topics. Yeah. So we're just trying huh. to give students Wait, so resources. So what is it called again? Just in the, case anyone's interested. Yeah, it's called the Aspiring Scientist Coalition, okay. ASC, ASK. So, and it's free to join. Everything's free. Um, and if you're listening to this and you're a scientist and you want to present or speak to our, our student members about your career trajectory or give tips, please contact me. Yeah. I mean, I think most people listening to this are scientists because I'd say uh, most of our listeners are like either PhD or postdocs uh, at one of the Max Planck Institutes. Awesome. So... I'm assuming. Yeah. Everyone could be interested. Yeah. We would love so to have that's you. really cool. Yeah. Okay. So that was a very interesting conversation about your science communication journey. Um, a lot to learn. I think science communication as a career option is becoming more and more popular. Um, so that's why I really wanted to do this podcast. So that's part one. Thank you all so much for listening and stay tuned for part two, which will be a conversation on autism and the neuroscience of empathy and pain, which will be released next week. If you would like to learn more about Ben and his science communication, then I would recommend you check out his website, which is benrine.com, where you can find the links to social media pages and everything else that you wanna know about him. And if you like our podcasts, make sure to follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Thanks again for listening. Bye. Offspring Magazine, the podcast is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net Science Communication Group known as the Offspring Magazine. The intro-outro music is composed by Srinath Rankumar, and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizo. If you have any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye.